Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Facebook Live and our morning devotions. I trust that uh, you had a good night, and uh, it was a blessing to me to be back in the pulpit last night and to be sharing uh, with you from the Word of God once again, and I'm glad to be back this morning uh, together with you. And I want to invite you to go back with me to 2 Corinthians chapter number 7, and we'll continue our study there this morning. And as you're turning, I want to invite you to be in prayer for uh, some members of our church family. Uh, be in prayer for TJ, for Andrew, and for Evelyn. Uh, they're heading out today going to Bible college, and this is a big step for Evelyn and Andrew. They're uh, newly graduated from high school, first time living away from home, and taking a huge step of faith and and we need to just uphold them to the Lord in prayer. Of course, TJ is returning for his second year of Bible college, and we're proud of what the Lord is accomplishing in him. And these young people have worked hard uh, this summer to save their nickels and dimes and uh, to uh, be able to go off to school. And so uh, I, I think that it's only fitting for us to uplift them with our prayers. Many of you have... Uh, gone into your own pockets to try to help them in some way, and I know that it is much appreciated, and uh, if the Lord puts it in your heart to do something to help them, sure, surely they would appreciate it, and it would always be needful. Uh, they're not going there on uh, scholarships, per se. They're, they're having to work. They're having to pay their way, and that's a part of their training is learning how to live by faith, and so let's um, keep them lifted up to the Lord in prayer. I'm continuing to improve uh, in my health. The uh, air quality has really impacted my, uh, uh, my sinuses with my allergies and so forth. And I talked to the doctor's office yesterday and they said that that is a recurrent theme uh, with their patients. And so uh, that's uh, aggravating a lot of things uh, and uh, But I'm trusting the Lord that he's going to see me all the way through this. And I'm counting on your prayers and uh, your support and encouragement uh, through these days. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And I'll begin reading in verse number 1 where the Bible says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Receive us, we have wronged no man, we have corrupted no man, we have defrauded no man. I speak not this to condemn you, for I have said before that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. Great is my boldness of speech toward you, great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort, I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. For when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus, not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he told us your earnest desire your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoiced the more. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Let's pray for a moment. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us from out of thy word. Lord, use me to be a blessing to these precious ones who have Come on to this Bible study this morning. I pray that, Lord, by thy Holy Spirit, you would minister to each of us. 
And these things I pray in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. As we have been here in this passage of Scripture, we begin with the foundation in verse number one that we have been given a promise. And there are two promises that God gave to those that choose to live that separated life that's spoken of in the prior passage. And those are that the Lord will receive us and that we will enjoy with him that relationship in its fullest potential that he calls us to between a father and a child. And since we have these promises, we are called to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, positionally, we have already been cleansed. Of course, we have been made the very righteousness of God through the finished work of the beloved one, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross of Calvary. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. But what we're seeing here (coughs) is a call to practical sanctification, to submitting ourselves every day to the ongoing working of the Holy Spirit through the ministry of the Word of God in our lives. And certainly this would be indicated by what we have said, that as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. The choices that we make will be the choices to live a life that is of honor to the Lord Jesus Christ, conforming to all that he is calling us to be, even as he told the Ephesian believers in Ephesians 4 to uh, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we have been called, to live up to the standing that God has given to us uh, positionally and judiciously. And so we are called to cleanse ourselves from the filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And this is to come up into maturity, to grow up into the measure of that perfect man or that that fully developed Christian person uh, into the measure of the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ, even as we read of in Ephesians chapter number four. And so what we discover is that those people that are truly growing in the Lord in this earthly realm may not be sinless, but they will, by this practicing of the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, sin less and less. It's not going to be something that uh, by course they choose to involve themselves with. And so uh, when we understand the fear of God, we, we recognize, as we have said the last few times together, that it is not that I am afraid of God. It is that I stand in awe and in respect of the the person and the presence and the purity and the power of God. And when I do that, and I'm mindful of the fact that this holy God is in me, and he's with me, and he's all around me, it changes the choices that I make. It impacts my life in every decision, great and small. And so I would simply say that it is incumbent upon us as believers who have been called to perfect holiness in the fear of God to begin to practice the presence of God in our lives, to live with the reality that God is indeed in me, that he's with me, that he's all around me, that he hears every word that I speak. He sees everything that I do. He knows every thought that I think. He sees all that catches my gaze. And so God understands all of these things, and it should uh, be something that we are eminently aware of and that that we allow Uh, to change the choices that we make. And certainly what that would produce in us 
is a desire to be more like him. And yesterday we talked about the fact that what it will produce in us is a desire to have a testimony of purity and of love. And that's what Paul said. He said, we have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. And he wasn't saying that to compare himself to others or lift himself up. He said, uh, I've said before that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. He said, listen, uh, literally, I, I've given my life to to help you to grow in the increase of your faith, to help you mature in the Lord. And, and literally, Paul was willing and ready to even if need be die for these people that he loved. And we talked about how that he uh, affirmed his love to them and he spoke very plainly and he takes them to the record of his speech, the boldness and plainness of his speech, uh, even as we read this morning, but it was all to the extent that he may demonstrate his love for them. Uh, we talked about that last night in our um, Bible study in the midweek service out of Proverbs 27, that faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are his deceit. And what we understand is that Paul uh, shared uh, the love of God with them and at times spoke to them plainly and bluntly, but he always spoke in a manner that affirmed the love that he had toward them. They knew that he loved them. And, and now uh, many of them had uh, affirmed their love toward him. And uh, it's interesting as we read through the epistles to the church in Corinth that in the first epistle, they were among the most rebuked churches in the New Testament period. But in the second epistle, they were among the most praised because they had responded to the things that they had been admonished about. And I wonder, are we like that wise son in Proverbs that, that loveth the one that rebukes them and, and uh, affects a change, appropriates the things in our lives that have been pointed out to us? Or do we get our backs up and do we get this idea that it's nobody's business, that's between me and the Lord? Who do you think you are to say anything to me? You know, sometimes people get that kind of an attitude going on. And the truth is that uh, if that's our attitude, who can help us? You say, well, God can. Well, listen, you're not listening to him if you have that attitude. Certainly, if we are living out the life of Jesus Christ, that would be a life of meekness and lowliness of mind that would indicate humility and that we're willing to listen uh, with the humility of heart and mind. And so we notice here that the Bible reveals to us uh, that Paul is saying, look, ye are in our hearts to die and to live with you. What a great statement he made to affirm his love toward them. But then we discover something further, and that is in verse number four, great is my boldness of speech, Okay, and he said, uh, great is my glory of you. I'm filled with comfort. I'm exceeding joyful in all your tribulation. For when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. We were troubled on every side. Uh, without were fightings, within were fears. Nevertheless, God that comforted those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus, not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you, when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me so that I rejoiced the more. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. So, when we practice the presence of God and we desire to perfect holiness in the fear of the Lord, it will produce, as we have said, first of all, a desire to be more like him, to be more like the Holy One. Secondly, it will produce 
uh, a desire to have a testimony of purity and of love. And thirdly, it will produce a desire to communicate truth carefully, to communicate truth carefully. What we find is that uh, Paul didn't just come in with guns a-blazing, hacking and flailing to try to set things in order as a, as a bowl in a china shop, so to speak. We have referenced this verse uh, in past studies, but I would like to read it in Ephesians chapter 4, it says in verse 15. <clears throat> but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So what are we called to do? We are to speak the truth in love. The Bible says in verse 25, Wherefore, putting away lying, let every man speak truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, <coughs> working with his hands the thing which is good that he, may, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So when I live with the awareness that God is in me, he's with me, he's all around me, it will produce a desire within me to tr communicate the truth carefully. Sometimes the way in which we communicate the truth is such that those that need to hear it never quite receive it because our attitude has so shrouded what we're trying to say that they didn't receive it. And, and we may justify it as saying, well, you know, the Bible says faithful are the wounds of a friend, so I'm going to go ahead and wound them. No, Paul was being very careful, explaining the situation to them, giving them the background data that would help them to understand why he was telling them the things that he was telling them in the manner that he was saying it and at the time that he was saying it. Sometimes I think that we just are so blunt that our words don't minister grace and they don't edify, but rather they corrupt, they hurt. And so let me just say that the way we communicate is perhaps as important and maybe at times even more important than that which we're trying to say. You see, Paul understood that, uh, look, what he was saying needed to be heard. And so the way in which he said it would determine whether or not it was going to be received. Um, I, I despise electronic communication. Those of you that know me uh, know that I'd much rather sit down face to face and, and talk to someone. I... Um, I think that if, if people are at odds with one another, there are things that can be communicated by face-to-face -face that can never be communicated electronically. Now, I realize that in the world in which we live, sometimes it's inevitable that we're going to have to communicate electronically. But, you know, I'm going to tell you something. You can't see tears through a text message. You can't sense the tone of someone's voice. You can't sense the humility of their posture. You can't hear the brokenness in their tone. You can't see the sadness in eyes. You can't sense and have your spirit bear witness with their spirit. But if there's a problem that exists between you and people communicate by means of text, often what happens is, those messages or emails, whatever the case may be, or social media posts are read and reread. They're parsed. They're thought about. They're meditated upon. They're taken apart and questioned. I wonder what they meant by this. You know, I don't know about you, but 
I've come to a place anymore where I just absolutely despise uh, news commentary on important uh, things. And I'm going to tell you why. Because it presumes that I'm not smart enough to draw my own conclusions. It presumes that I have no idea what anybody was talking about there and I need somebody to tell me. It presumes that I am a moron. You know, the fact of the matter is I feel like I could give some of them some commentary. I don't need them to tell me what they think someone said. Just let me hear what they said and let me draw my own conclusions. And, uh, I, you know, listen, I can tell you what every left-leaning media organization is going to say about the RNC. And I can tell you what every right-leaning media organization is going to say about the DNC. I mean, it's just so predictable. It's as predictable as forecasting warmth in the summer in Phoenix. It, you know, I mean, it doesn't take a genius to say it's going to be hot in Phoenix in the summer, all right? And we just know what's going to be said. But folks, listen, what I'm going to say to you is this. Look, we don't need to kind of acquiesce to this whole idea, well, this is the way I have to communicate. And uh, no, listen, every once in a while, we need to make the sacrifice. If you're worried about COVID, put on a mask and social distance, but sit down with someone and let them hear your tone, sense your spirit, see your tears, understand your cries, see your posture and understand your heart towards them. And, and, and look, Paul is saying, listen, even though my, my speech was boldness toward you, toward you, I want you to know that great is my glorying of you. I'm exulting in, in the advances that you're making and in the, in the growth that you're demonstrating in the Lord. And he said, I am filled with comfort and I'm exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. Why? He said, look, I'm having problems. I'm going through difficulty, but you know what? My heart is overflowing with joy over all that the Lord is accomplishing in you and through you. He was desirous to be careful to communicate the truth to them in a way that they would understand his heart. And listen, I heard a statement many years ago, and I think that it's true. And that is this. Um, the devil's crowd will hate us for our position, but they should never hate us for our disposition. Let me say that again. The devil's crowd will hate us for our position, but they should never hate us for our disposition. Many years ago, when I was the front on the front line of, a, of the stand in California uh, against domestic partnerships being granted all of the privileges and rights of, of married individuals, which we knew was a precursor towards same-sex marriage. And when, we were, when I was uh, really uh, a, a statewide spokesperson and, and on the uh, talk shows and news channels and interviewed every day for 21 days by uh, media organizations and, and so forth, and there were a number of people that were just hostile. In fact, I uh, received multitudes of death threats and threats against my family, my home, the ministry. Um, I was told by the chief of police I needed to carry a firearm, and he gave me his uh, card, his personal cell phone number. He said, if, if anybody stops you, have them call me immediately. I'll just validate for you that uh, there is legitimate threats against you, that you didn't have time to go through a licensure and so forth. And so um, I, I understood the hatred and the vitriol. It was amazing to me how that uh, those that were fighting would often carry signs that say, hate is not a family value. And yet they were the ones that were threatening murder and mayhem and sodomy and child rape, threatening that against my family, threatening firebombing and, and intimidation and all of these things. And the hypocrisy on the left is just incredible, really, when you consider it. But many times people would want to come in and they would meet with me. And I can remember very clearly uh, there's a member of the United States Congress now who 
was the vice mayor of our city, which had the fourth largest population of homosexuals in the country, the second largest gay pride event in the country every year. And, uh, but uh, a member of Congress now who was the vice mayor uh, had a chief of staff that was very upset with me. And, uh, and so he called me and said, I want to come and, and I want to talk to you. So we made an appointment and I was prepared for anything. Uh, and, and, and this man came uh, into my office and, and I was cordial to him. I greeted him with a handshake. I looked him in the eye. I offered him coffee. I, I uh, asked him to make himself comfortable and, and we sat down and, and we just had a conversation. And do you know what I did? I listened. I gave him the respect of a hearing. He asked for an appointment. He received one. Uh, he was greeted with uh, kindness and hospitality. And I listened. And you know what? I asked him questions. And, uh, and I listened to what he had to say. And I shared with him what my thoughts were in a kind-hearted fashion. And I told him that, listen, God does not like the sin in my life any more than he likes it in anyone else's. But I'm not trying to establish special rights because of my sin. I want to have humility in my heart because of it. And I want to show kindness to others who are held in that same bondage. And, and I uh, did not know what to expect and the man was sharing his personal story. I remember it as if it were yesterday and it were, was perhaps, oh, 20, 23 years ago, 20, 22, 22, 23 years ago. And uh, the man got tears in his eyes. And before he left, he said, uh, Reverend Chapel, I, I just want to say something to you. And I said, what's that? And he said, this meeting did not go at all like I anticipated that it might. And he said, you're not at all like I thought you might be. And I, I just want to say thank you for showing me kindness and respect today. And I said, I'm sorry that, that you anticipated anything else because I just want to show you the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I said, you know what, I'm going to tell you something. God doesn't love me more than he loves you. The fact is he loves us the same. I, I said, could I offer a word of prayer for you? Well, I, I looked up after I closed the prayer and here's a man that was an avowed homosexual activist who was weeping because he didn't know how to receive truth when it was shared in love. And the fact of the matter is that that could have never been accomplished through a letter. It could have never been done by an email or by text message, only by him sitting down face to face. And you know, there are some people that you need to hazard the inconvenience, put on a mask and sit, sit six feet across the room and you need to talk to. You need to say, look, I want the Lord to be present in this conversation. I'm practicing his presence. He's here with us. He's right here beside me. He's in me. He's all around us. And, and I want his spirit to shine through and I want him to have the victory in this matter. And when I practice the presence of the Holy One in my life, it produces a desire within me to communicate the truth lovingly and carefully so that nothing is lost in the interpretation and in the communication of that truth. Paul said, listen, God comforted us, but not by, his com by the coming of Titus, but not by that only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you. He's affirming them. He's letting them know, listen, I'm not just about beating you up. I'm not just about trying to fix you. I'm thankful for what God is doing in your life. So while there was a, 
an apostolic rebuke that came to them. And while there were issues that needed to be addressed, there was also the affirmation that they had been making changes, that they were listening, and that it was truly making a difference indeed. Folks, when we practice the presence of the Lord, it'll change our tone. It'll change our tongue, though it will never change the truth. It might change how that truth is received. I hope you'll think about that today. Practice the presence of God in your life and may it produce within you a desire to very carefully communicate God's truth and the truth that you feel that you must share with others. I hope that you have a wonderful day and I'll see you again here tomorrow, the Lord willing.